Hello and good evening. My name is Lynn Cameron from Uppsala University in the Young Academy of Europe. And we're here tonight with uh, Professor Rodis Benaria, an eminent economist and an emeritus professor of city and regional planning at Cornell University. Hello, Lourdes, and thank you Hello. so much for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, a great fan of your work. I think you've made tremendous contributions. And I wanted to interview you today because I was really inspired by the talk you gave in Barcelona in March for International Women's Day. So this made me really feel like I'd like to know more about you and basically what makes you you. And so I'd like to start a bit from the basics. You mentioned in March that you grew up in the Pyrenees. I, I so grew up in the what we call here Central Pyrenees, which is where the highest mountains are, mm -hmm. near the peak of uh, Aneto, which mm -hmm. is the highest mountain in the Pyrenees. So, uh, very narrow valleys. Uh, I was born in a small village. At that time, it probably had 300 inhabitants, and now it may have 150 in the winter time. Many more people in the summer time. And I was born there in 1937 when there were no roads in the valley. The, 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 I still remember the first time I saw a car. I was five years old. And we went to the nearest town where there were cars and buses mm -hmm. um, by horse, which is my father had horses. And uh, we went by horse and then it was the first time then the feeling of getting into a car and seeing those, for the first time, seeing those trees coming towards me. It seemed like the trees were coming towards me, not that we were moving. And it was a very strange feeling. I remember it so vividly. I guess there are not many people in, in Spain that grew up without, at first at least, without mm -hmm. seeing a car. I was not even uh, aware of the sound of motors, you know, a motor. There were no tractors in mm -hmm. the valleys of the Pyrenees. It was, it was a self-contained economy, a subsistence economy. Most of the valleys were the closest one, the highest ones. Mm -hmm. um, and when I've been in the third world or in many developing countries, uh, when we talk about the subsistence economy, I, th I often have thought, well, yes, I lived it. I lived this when I was a kid. Now the valleys are very globalized. Mm -hmm. Tourism, ski, uh, lo local agriculture is gone. They, were only the, uh, they only have now the gardens that people, you know, the, the vegetables that they grow to for self-consumption. And that's all there is. Yeah, no, more tr uh, no more wheat, no more, uh, no more not even potatoes. Or, unless it's in the backyard. All of this is gone. The local economy that I saw is gone. And so I have seen the, these transitions. Uh, I have lived through these transitions that we see in many developing countries now, where the local agriculture gets uh, swallowed up by the forces, economic forces that come from outside. And in many ways, you know, my valley is one of the valleys that has the most beautiful. It's um, it's a um, um, it, it, it was declared UNESCO. So I say in, in English. World Heritage Site. Yes, uh, because it has eight beautiful Romanesque churches mm -hmm. in a in a small space of a small valley. It's a small valley, and they are very beautiful. Twelve. Uh, 12, 13 centuries. One of them even goes back to the 11th century. And they are really mm, uh, magnificent. And that is what has attracted also, ap apart from the beautiful landscape, many tourists and, and is now, uh, you know, globalized, very different valley. So in many ways, I thought that I've gone from the, I remember once <laughs> in New York City, when I lived in New York, we had a, a women's group and one of the things we had to do to introduce ourselves was to talk about our background. And people would say, well, I'm from a working class family, I am from a middle class family, describing. And when, when my turn came, I said, you know, I am medieval. I come from a medieval background. It was not working class, it was not upper class or middle class, it was medieval. And transformed very quickly, but, but uh, that is part of my background. Is that what you wanted to hear? <laughs> what were your family like? Uh, do you have siblings? So yeah, I was the youngest of six, and uh, by a big difference. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, my family was, you know, a fairly conservative mm -hmm. uh, family who um, 
had some land, but not much. I mean, the, if my family was relatively well to do, it had to do with more with um, the different things that my father, in a way, was uh, like a, uh, a jack of all trades. You know, doing uh, he had uh, a uh, he had horses and would transport tourists that came, that uh, left their car or whatever they had to stop and then go to the to the through the valley with horses, or they he also you know traded with. Um, with uh, different animals such as sheep and uh, cows, and, and the sheep that the sheep meant that, uh, that he bought uh, wool uh, from the from the sheep in the valley and sold it somewhere else. You know these different things he, he had different things uh, to do, and that's what my family was like. It was not a typical, not a peasant family as we would say, because it was m most of the. Uh, whatever the family had had to do had different sources, and so that's why it was difficult for me to define clearly, you know, my background. And your mother was a husband. My mother, she yes, she came more from a more uh, traditional family that had land, mm -hmm. and it was from a different village, a beautiful house that was uh, well. We have photos of it uh, built in the 16th century. So that was very or not that was not the case with my father. My father, my father's father was an orphan, mm -hmm. and he grew up with an aunt. And probably we think that the family and the name Beneria came from um, the Pyrenees, but more to the west, mm -hmm. well, the part that is not uh, Catalonia anymore. Mm -hmm. But we're not sure about that. And your life, of course, took a very different trajectory because you went to the big city and mm -hmm. you got a PhD. Is there a precedence, or are you the first PhD in your family? I think I'm the first PhD, but there, there were precedents of of uh, siblings that studied. Mm -hmm. One of my sisters was a teacher. The other one was uh, what we call here pharmacist, which is not the same as in English. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, here a pharmacist is someone who studies the same amount of time and uh, and different topics as the, as doctors. Mm -hmm. He's considered she is considered to be like a doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, these were my precedents. The, the rest of the siblings did not go through university. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was the one who was more determined to do it, even though I was the youngest. I'm not sure I was the youngest. I don't think my parents had destined for me to, uh, to go to the university. But I wanted to go, so they, they let me. And what kind of, was that a fight or did no, you have it to No, it was not a fight, that? but I did, I do remember saying to my, because when I told my father I wanted to move on to university when I finished high school, he said, why, you know, you're going to get married, you're not going to, you can help me with different things and you don't need to go to university. And I said, no, no, I do, I do want to go. But my father died a year later. I don't know what would have happened if he had lived. He might have said, "This is now. No, there's no need for you to go to university." I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, he had died. My mother said, "Fine," mm -hmm. and in the traditional Pyrenees Mountains, it's the oldest brother they inherited. It's a primogeniture oh. mm -hmm. system, so the oldest brother was the one who had to pay the bills. Yep. So, and he said, "Fine," and and or at least he said, "Okay." I'm not sure it was so fine, but. <laughs> Um, but I went, I went to university and, and I did economics, which is, was very unusual and nobody understood what is this economics. It was the first year that the University of Barcelona had economics. Uh, they had just, uh, that's why we, I, I did so, because I saw it in the paper, there was, I didn't know what to study. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very um, unsure. And all I need, I wanted, I, I was sure that I didn't want to be, do the pharmacy because all the women went in that direction. I didn't want to do um, what at that time here they used to call letras. Letras meant humanities. Mm -hmm. All the women that I knew were going in that direction. I wanted to be somewhat original. I don't know where this came from. And, and then I read that article, the University of Barcelona next year is going to have a new uh, faculty and a new, a new department that is going to call economics. And I thought, that sounds interesting. And my only reason to, 
justify it was it's going to help me find out the difference between capitalism and socialism. Because it was like a question I had in my mind I couldn't understand. And I thought, well, this may help. And this was as little as that uh, that helped me decide to do economics. There were three women uh, out of 70 the first year. There were only three uh, of us. One of these women went to Madrid. The other one fell a little bit behind. So when, by the time we finished, I was the only one. But there was a second one that had, uh, had uh, joined us in our third year. Mm -hmm. So there was only two really got the degree the first time. How did your male classmates treat you? Were you just another student or did you stand out for being a woman? Well, they were, they were very polite, very nice. But the, the, the gender relationship was very typical. Very typical. I think I was that nice girl, that nice girl that was coming from the mountains. And, um, and she was a fairly good student. I didn't have very, very high because uh, some of the topics, uh, it seemed like it was there, the, the, ma the male's uh, field and not mine, like statistics or mm -hmm. mathematics. Uh, but I did well in math and that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. In economics, it's, uh, it was very helpful. And they were, they were nice. You know, now when I look back, I thought that it was such a sexist environment when you think, but I was not, I was not that way at that time. Mm -hmm. Of the, of the sexism of the, the setup. You used a really interesting phrase, the nice girl from the mountains. Mm. If you would come from Barcelona, do you think they'd see you differently if you had an urban? Well, as you can imagine, I, I was not a very cultured person. My background was rich in many ways, but it was not cultured. I, I remember going to the first concert of classical music with some of my friends, and at the end of the, of the concert, you know, when they do a, uh, they, they give you a, a gift of another little piece. It was a Beethoven piece, I don't remember which one it was. And one of my friends said, Beethoven. And I remember looking at her and said, how does she know? <laughs> and ever since then, you know, I kept going to the concert so that I would become familiar like she was with Beethoven's music or somebody else's music. But I was this girl from the mountains because you know, I, I was a few years behind everybody in, in this cultural sense. And so I had to, to really work at it. It mm -hmm. took me an effort. It took an effort, and including at that time, the, the Pyrenees Mount, Catalan Mountain, was very now too. It, there's a difference between the, the accent in the Pyrenees uh, from the accent in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. The Barcelona accent is supposed to be the, the fine accent and then even more so. So I remember coming here and I, I heard how my classmates were making fun of a guy who, who was speaking, not even the, the mountains, um, Catalan, but the same province, Catalan, Lerida province, Catalan. And they were making fun of him. And I said, oh my God, they're making fun of him. They'll make even more fun of me. From then on, I started to shift my accent. And at this point, it's like talking to different languages. I shift. The, he, the minute I hear Catalan from the mountains, I shift. Mm -hmm. And the minute I hear Catalan from Barcelona, which is the most common because I live here, I speak Catalan from Barcelona. So I think that's why it was easy for me to learn languages, because I was trilingual Spanish, Catalan from the mountains, and Catalan from Barcelona. <laughs> And if we go from the mountains to the big city, can you describe how it felt the first time you went to New well, York? Well, like, oh, to New York, oh, that was something else. Barcelona was a big step, and even before Barcelona, I did my high school in the capital of the province. I was mm -hmm. from Lleida, so Lleida. Yeah, uh, so it was gradual. Lleida first, Barcelona second, and that was a big uh, shift. But then, before I went to New York City, I was in Paris for a mm -hmm. summer, where I learned French. And then I was in London for the first year after I had a, a fellowship in London. And I began to learn, Eng well, I had to start English here, but until you have a real immersion, you don't learn much. And even after one year, my English was not so great. So I wanted to go back, but it was hard to get a fellowship to, to study in, uh, in London or in, 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 in the UK. 
And so they said it would be easier if you apply for a fellowship to the U.S. I really didn't want to go to the U.S. That was 1961 or 61. And, uh, but they said, apply for, for a Fulbright. And I did. And they gave it to me. So <laughs> uh, that took me to the U.S. Uh, for a master's. Mm -hmm. First I did a master's. And then I came back here with what uh, I came back here because I, uh, well, I didn't have to, but I, my idea was to just do a master's. Mm -hmm. But I, I met the person who became my husband in New York. And uh, um, when I came back here, he, he followed me. And then uh, when we went back together. So it was not the second time, it was not the decision be, um, because I had the fellowship, but because I had married an American. And, but I did have the idea of following my studies, continuing with my studies. And once back in New York, I managed to do it, to do my PhD then, when we went back to the US. So how it felt, is that what you asked me? Oh, to I, well, the very first time you set foot in New York. Oh, the very first so time, I felt like a it, little ant in a huge mountain. I remember looking up those uh, skyscrapers, feeling, oh my God, what is this? No sun, not, there's not enough sun in the streets. I grew up with lots of sun, but the, the, uh, you, know, you know New York City, and, and there is not that much sun in the streets because the, the big walls don't let the sun in. And that, that feeling of not having enough sun and those huge um, buildings get, that I found somewhat inhuman. I got used to them eventually. Uh, uh, and so that, that feeling of also, in addition to this, which is my physical very first reaction, then New York, of course, is so immense in terms of the human uh, connections and the, and, and the different lives that exist and within the same city. I was very surprised to see so many uh, Afro-Americans. I didn't expect it because in Europe, at least at that time, we had the idea that America meant blue eyes and, and blonde hair. And that was my idea. And I, when you get to New York City and you see Puerto Ricans, many blacks, of course, uh, many Latin Americans, in addition to Puerto Ricans, although at that, in the early 60s, they dominated the Puerto Ricans. Later on, later on, many Dominicans, now very many Mexicans well, from all over the place. But in addition, you, wherever you go, you meet people from all over the world. That sense of cosmopolitanism is always overwhelming. Plus, there are tremendous number of things that you don't have time to go to. You always feel deprived in New York City because you would like to go to so many places you can't make it. Especially later on when I had kids, I didn't have the, the, the ability to do this. You have that feeling. But it's a city that you love and at times you hate because it, it produces all these different reactions. Now, of course, from the distance, having lived there for so many years, I miss it. But I wouldn't want to leave it at this, there right now. And uh, then when you started your PhD at Columbia, was this before or after you had your children? It was, I started, uh, in my first year, um, I didn't have children, mm -hmm. but then I got pregnant and I took off for mm -hmm. a few years and I went back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. No, in 1970 I went back and I finished it uh, in 1975. Yeah. Were your family supportive when you decided to go back? How did they feel? My family you? here? No, your, fa your husband and your oh, children. Oh, my husband was, yes, he was very supportive, yeah. I have no complaints. Um, be, uh, uh, he was a student, of a, he was a PhD student as well. So mm -hmm. both of us arrived with fellowships, mm -hmm. loans. We managed to, to do that. And so we were at this point very uh, uh, much the same footing, yeah. How was Colombia? Colombia was difficult. Mm -hmm. I was in the Department of Economics and it was a big shock to me because economics here in Barcelona was a fairly liberal profession. And it also, it, it, in the Anglo-Saxon Latin definitions of liberal, 
it was also liberal in the United States, mm -hmm. but it was much more, it was much heavier in the sense of being immersed in orthodox economics, mm -hmm. much more than here. Uh, you know, the tendency here in many universities is sort of like you have a politicized student body that's quite leaning towards the left, whereas in the United States it's just the opposite, and especially in departments of economics. And I was very kind of shocked by how economics defended the status quo, in, in, if you looked very carefully mm -hmm. into what we were doing. So it, it was difficult for me because I found it too technified, you know, too relying too much uh, on, t on techniques and not, not paying enough attention to the philosophy of, of the science or science or, of the profession of economics. It's gotten much, much worse since then. If you talk to students now, you say, well, that was nothing because it has become you know, like a mathematical science almost. And, and I was already complaining at that time. Um, uh, so imagine how much it has changed. Uh, but the, the problem is still very similar to, I felt that it was very similar to the complaints that some students have now. Um, was the, the kind of feeling that I had. Of, uh, so uh, many times I hesitated about to, whether I should shift to another social science. I thought mm -hmm. about, uh, about sociology, I thought about political science. But I, at the end I decided that I was right when I was 17 years old, that economics allows you to understand the world in a fairly deep way. And I stayed. And I, I'm not sorry I stayed, mm -hmm. you know, even though I complained. And it has allowed me to understand how the world works, really, um, to the present time. And so I think that my decision was wise to, wise to stay and do economics at, at the end. And this actually ties in a lot with your subsequent research. So I was really inspired in March in Barcelona when you were talking about women's unpaid labor. So what drove you to address these issues? Well, first, the feminist movement made me think about this because it's, I had not thought about gender differences uh, to the extent that the feminist movement of the late 60s and early 70s and, uh, stimulated us to think about it. And, when I, and that happened when I was already working on my, or, or thinking about my thesis. And I decided I really didn't want to write a thesis about women's issues. I wanted to do the same thing that the boys did. And so my thesis was about economic growth and education in Spain mm -hmm. during the Franco period. Um, but then uh, when I was looking for data, I realized that there were a lot of the data that I was working with had the gender bre oh, yeah, gender breakdown. Uh, uh, educational rates for women, educational rates for men at the primary level, secondary level, mm -hmm. university level. So I collected this data by gender. I didn't put it into the thesis, the, the, the gender data, but I became very interested in it. So my first published paper had to do with the gender difference in education in Spain. And that was my first inroad into gender issues and, and women's issues, uh, which was published, that, that article was published. And that led me to a job offer I had at the ILO in Geneva. I was already teaching at that time and in at Rutgers University, I taught first. And uh, a, a colleague said, you know, the ILO is looking for somebody like you who would work on, on rural women and I said, I don't know anything about rural women. I've only done some work on women in Spain, but I am interested in women's issues. I went for a, I said, my, I asked my husband, because I had two children, and we don't want to go to Geneva. My husband had, um, was out of his job that following year. He said, yeah, we can go. Uh, I'm not going to be teaching, so we can go. We went, and I, and I went for an interview, and they offered me the, the job. And that opened up a completely different area of research because it was, uh, I was to be coordinator of a program on rural women that the ILO had set up. That was in 1978. It was one of the first at the, at the UN level. It was one of the first programs that was focusing on these issues. 
And uh, there had already been before me one more person, uh, Ingrid Palmer, who lives in, uh, used to live, went from Geneva to Brighton, England, uh, but he was Austral she was Australian. And so I was the second person that was in command of the program. And I arrived there, you know, and talk, do work on rural women all over the world. I didn't know anything about developing countries. I didn't know anything about women in developing countries, and rural women even less. So the first thing I had to do was to start reading. There was nothing in economics, in economic journals or economic books, except for, no, except, there was not an exception yet. There, there was, yes, there was an exception. It was Esther Buss Rupp's book, Women's Role in Economic Development. There was an eye-opening. She was a Danish economist who had worked in the UN, and at the end of her UN career, wrote that book, Women's, uh, Women's Role in Economic Development. And that was wonderful. And, but there was very little else in economics. So I had to start reading about rural women all over the world. The ILO had already um, paid for some studies in different areas of the world, different countries. And so that was extremely useful. And I started to read that most of that was not economics strictly. It came from anthropologists, from sociologists, a little bit, but not much a political scientists, most, mostly anthropology and um, sociology. So that made me much more interdisciplinary because what I had, the background I had was about labor markets. My specialty was labor markets and development. And so uh, I, all the readings I had done in graduate school had nothing about rural women in, de in developing countries. They didn't even ask the question of, do women um, do, women do different in development? It, Esther Basrab did. She, her thesis was that development, in quotes, you know, development as it had happened during colonial times all the way to the late 1970s, had had very different effects on men and women. And that was revolutionary because not, not in, my, in my courses on development, nobody was ever asking a question whether the development had affected men and women differently. But Rob showed us for Africa, Latin America and Asia that it was different. And so that was very helpful to, based on, on Basrab, to expand the area of research. And of course, I was in a privileged position because the ILO had some money to do studies in different parts of the world. And we were getting studies from, I remember one from Bangladesh that was extremely interesting, that um, uh, touched the question of, of um, uh, seclusion. And I remember it, it was a shock to me that one of the questions that the sociologist asked was asking women, what would you like your daughter to be when she grows up? And many of them said, I would like her to be secluded. And it was such a shock that women would, would say that. And of course, then you have to understand why. And one of the answers to this puzzling uh, answer was mm, that uh, secluded women were from middle class and upper class. And the, and the women that did work in the fields were poor women. They didn't want their daughters to be poor. So one symbol for them was seclusion. Uh, so it takes a while to get to these answers. And, and there were studies that were in, just as interesting as that. Remember, also there was one about Papua New Guinea that had um, uh, part of the study dealt with um, indi indigenous women, uh, some about Africa much fewer than uh, Latin America. But of course, that, was, uh, that job was an eye-opening that had uh, uh, many important repercussions on what I did afterwards. Because I also at the ILO, uh, what I started to do was to do what eventually I called the uh, accounting for women's work. And that came from a visit and a study that the ILO paid for, their, for Morocco. Uh, I, I had to go to evaluate whether the project that had been sent to us was worth, you know, doing and funding. And I remember I, w I prepared, I did my homework to go to Morocco and I, did, I looked at statistics and it said women's labor force participation rate, uh, 8%, 9%. Men's labor force participation rate, 79%, uh, 75%. Okay, that was in my mind. We went to Morocco 
and uh, we ended up in a hotel in a place called Sichuan, which is a mountain resort in northern Morocco, beautiful town. And we got up in the morning, and uh, it was quite early, you know, and the, the town was very busy, but mostly what you would see were lots of women carrying all kinds of things. It was like an outhouse of women. With, sometimes with their children. One of them was carrying a basket on, on the, her head to take it to the oven, the, the village oven. Others were bringing the bread back to their homes. Others were carrying other things. They were going shopping. And many of them, as we saw some, uh, one of the women or two of them, were in a sort of, um, uh, like a little river. Barranco is in Spanish. It's, it's like, uh, what is it in English? It doesn't matter. It's a little river. Uh, where they were washing the clothes. And one of them had her feet, and it was not, it was November. It was not very cold, but it wasn't hot either. She had, she was washing with her feet in there. So it was hard work, all of these women, sometimes with their kids. They were doing two or three jobs at the same time. Uh, so, uh, and then we went back into the village. I, we saw men, they were sitting in front of the shops because it's a tourist shop, and it was the man who was selling. But it was not a touristic region, uh, a touristic season. November, there were no tourists. So, and the men were sitting, chatting, and I thought there is something wrong with the statistics I have in my head. Women's labor force participation rate, it seemed to be, you know, 90%. And men's labor force participation rate, yes, but they were unemployed, they were not doing really much. So I went back to the ILO and I told my colleagues, because I was in, in a, a program that was dealing with labor force statistics. And the first opportunity I had, I said, listen, uh, colleagues, there is something wrong with the statistics that we manage. Of course, these statistics come from each country. You know, and the ILO compiles them at the international level. But I thought something was wrong with the statistics because it doesn't reflect reality. So um, from then on, that became a very important project for me, to deal with the, what I call the uh, accounting for women's work. It was mostly because women were doing unpaid work, and, uh, and unpaid work did not count in national statistics. It still doesn't in many countries' statistics, because it doesn't go through the market. The way we define, we define uh, national, uh, national um, income, or gross national product statistics is uh, that we only account for paid work that, well, work that goes through the market. Mm -hmm. And that becomes part of, of a GNP, or it becomes uh, part of labor force statistics. Uh, so from then on, it, it has become also a feminist project, not just mine, to show that, that uh, those statistics needed correction. And of course, at the, at the um, official level, they have not been totally corrected, but there's been many effort in many countries that show you know, how much is unpaid work, how much is uh, the work that does, does not go through the market. And it, you know, it's been many years now, and many countries have even what is called satellite accounts that take into consideration unpaid work. Because and at the very official international level, it became official in preparation for the Beijing conference in 1995, because UNDP, uh, which it was a very nice project on the part of UNDP, they thought that that the, their preparation for the human de that year's human development report should be on this topic in preparation for the Beijing conference, and I was invited to the committee that prepared a report for the Beijing conference, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, the person that, that was, it had to be a man, the person that was heading the committee was Amartya Sen. Luckily, it was a wonderful man, you know. Amartya Sen, a Nobel Prize from India. And uh, so there was background work, there were uh, several, what they call background papers to prepare the final report, and those papers were based on diff 31 countries, north and south, um, estimating how much would be how much it was in each country, and the proportion of unpaid work, and what uh, proportion to GNP, how much of it was unpaid, how much of it was paid. And basically, each country, although there were many differences by country, 
each country, the study for, on each of these countries showed the same, that the proportion of unpaid work represented, well, if we take all of them into consideration, the range was between 25% and 45% of GNP. And so it was a lot. And, and I remember Marchison, when we were preparing that, and he saw these this statistics, he said, you know, they're not going to believe us. They won't believe that there's such a high proportion, that unpaid work represents such a high proportion of GNP, of total in GNP, if we take into consideration unpaid work. And, uh, but, you know, it was, we had 31 countries statistics in a study, and eventually it was published, and eventually it became, it was very influential in, in developing the kind of statistics that the Human Development Report incorporated. And, and they have been used ever since. The, uh, in this sense, UNDP, we should, you know, really uh, thank UNDP that, that it developed, it, it, it uh, dedicated that uh, effort in preparation for the Beijing conference. That, because from then on, I remember one of the concerns was at the World Bank, because there was some, some um, uh, shall I say, conf rivalry between the World Bank and UNDP on developing statistics, uh, the World Bank uh, always sort of uh, thinking that UNDP perhaps was too soft on some human or social matters. Uh, the concern was they will tell us that we are not rigorous enough with numbers. And, and we said, well, we have this. So we, we, we can show that these studies have been done and then they can be improved in the following years. So this was done. And uh, since then, since that year, uh, the Human Development Reports, uh, Report has a very good series of um, gender development index. I mean, they are not perfect. And there's been lots of literature developed after that uh, on how these statistics could be improved. Uh, it's still continuing now, but it, it was a real, a real turning point. And if you look at your, because you've done this tremendous work, if you look at where you are now in your career, how does that compare to where you saw yourself when you started your degree in Barcelona? Oh, I never thought I would, uh, I would do what I've done. Because first of all, I wasn't thinking international at that point. But I did take in my last year a course on international uh, development, the international economics it was called. And I was very interested. I think that course really influenced me. And uh, although I did not expect that I would actually live outside that I would be in the U.S. for 43 years, well, U.S. or other countries. Um, I did not expect that, but uh, I, I was interested already then in international issues. So in this sense, it was similar. But of course, the experience that you gain over the years changes many things. Do you feel you had to fight harder because you're a woman? Yes. When I got to the ILO and I proposed this uh, change, no, not change in the statistics, I said, we have to do something about it. But nobody wanted to discuss it. They thought I was, I was crazy. They, no, not crazy, but they thought I was naive. I mean, what, what do you want to measure? What do you want to measure about women's work? I mean, the, the number of hours you do sex, it, one of them said. Really? One, one of the assistants, one of the attendants. This person, though, an economist, has become a real ally, became a real ally. But that, that was a stupid reaction of his at that moment, not very well thought out, but then eventually uh, he changed. But um, yeah, it was difficult. And, also, and of course, when you go through different departments in universities, you always have to fight a little harder uh, because you're a woman. When you are young, you don't even dare to raise your hand. And then you have to struggle, especially me, who came from the Pyrenees Mountains and was not very used to, to raise my hand. I'm the youngest uh, of six children. Yes, and I was very shy, and it was a tremendous struggle. Uh, I don't, there are men who are shy as well, so I can, I can speak about my struggle with it. Why I became a college professor, it was not meant to be, it seemed. But I became a college professor because um, it was easier to have free time to take care of my children because the, the, the schedule of a college professor can be very flexible. You can teach in the morning, you can teach in the afternoon, and you can combine the different hours. So that's why I did that. I didn't want to do a, five, a nine to five job. 
So that's why I did that, not, not because I thought I was perfect to do that by any means, because the fear of speaking in public at first was really, I still remember my first class. <laughs> it was terrible, I had long notes, and I finished them in half an hour because it was going so fast that I didn't have a sense of, uh, it was a disaster, the first class, and then you learn, you learn. Is there anything you would have done differently looking back on your career? I would fight. I would get more angry. I was very polite all the time. I think I would learn to be angry and express the anger that you do feel inside, but you don't express it. And then as a final parting question, since we're a young academy, is there a particular message you'd like to give the next generation of young scientists and academics? Well, I think to continue the work that we have began. I think we've gone, we are lucky that we've gone through several decades of tremendously important change for women. And, um, and to continue that work, not let it go, because I sometimes think that we're going backwards. So uh, I would say don't forget the, the, the struggle that we went through in ma at many different levels, many different levels, because sometimes when I, I read some of the stuff that's been written now, I thought, you know, what is the meaning of this? Um, uh, uh, of course, one has different points of view. I'm not. I don't want to criticize it, but I do think that um, in terms of struggling and, and looking ahead about changing the world, wherever it's not, the world is not in good shape. Um, that uh, feminism became a little too complacent uh, during the. I would say. Uh, I would say from the late '80s on. Uh, that we move to, you know, the influence of postmodernism, which is interesting in many ways, but in other ways it has been a way of not talking about, or not connecting feminism to social issues and political issues enough. And uh, now I think we are finally looking, and some of the younger women see that that has been a problem, and so that we should go back and talk about social issues more and connecting. Um, representation with, um, how does Nancy, Nancy Fraser calls it, I mean, I I'm, not, I'm not remembering what she does, that mean, meaning the, the connecting the ideas that came from postmodernism with those that those of us in economics are very interested that had to do with the material, with, uh, with everyday social uh, struggle of making society a better society, more equal society, with the problems we have about inequality now and uh, the tensions around the world. I think the feminism should turn more into dealing with social issues and change the world. That, but that was already in Beijing. I remember a woman who said, women uh, have gone from asking the question, from, from complaining, from feel, feeling victims, to being those who think that they will change the world. But we haven't done enough of that. And so I think we should go, and I don't know who said that, but I always remembered. It was a wonderful phrase. And instead of doing that since the late 80s until recently, uh, we haven't really uh, been concerned enough about changing the world. Powerful words. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to interview you. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>